This is the third and final tape in a three-tape series entitled How to Hear God's Voice. On the very first tape, which was entitled God Does Speak, or, or His Sheep, God's Sheep Do Hear His Voice, on that first tape, I basically stressed the importance of hearing God's voice, the benefits of it. I talked about that there are three main things that we have to do to be able to recognize and hear God's voice. Number one was have a desire. You have to seek with all of your heart. As long as you can live without hearing the voice of God, you will. Number two, we needed to recognize that God is always speaking. It's like a television signal. He's always transmitting, but we aren't always receiving. So it's our receiver that needs to be fixed, not God's transmitter. And I also talked about how that there needed to be some downtime or time just spent being quiet and listening. And often people live a lifestyle that is not conducive to hearing the voice of God. He speaks in a still, small voice. And you've got to still yourself and listen to be able to hear the voice of God. In the second tape, which was entitled uh, How God Speaks, I was sharing that God communicates with our spirit, not brain to brain. It's not his mouth to our ear, and we don't hear from the outside, which most of us are accustomed to, but rather he speaks to our spirit. We base this on John 4:24. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And God communicates with our spirit, and then our spirit communicates with us as if it's our own thoughts, because it's, it's God's wisdom it's God's voice, but it's coming from our spirit. God communicates with our spirit, and then our spirit communicates with us and says, this is what I think God wants me to do. It comes in the first person, and because of that, a lot of people miss God speaking to them. They think it's their own thoughts. I coupled with that Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, which says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And I shared that basically when you are putting God first in your life, when you are delighting in him, seeking him above anything and everything else, then God changes your heart so that it only desires the things that are of God. God puts his desires in your heart so that a person who is truly seeking God with all of their heart can do what they want to do because their desires will have been influenced by God. They Their desires will actually be God's desires. Now, that's a big if, and it's a subjective thing. Many people could take what I've just said and say, well, my desire is to go get a new mate because I don't like the one I've got, and so that God's given me the desires of my heart, and I'm delighting myself in the Lord, and I know that's right. Well, that is wrong. That isn't right. And how can I say that? Well, because, and that's what this last tape is all about, that God's word is the ultimate test. Anything that you believe is God speaking to you must conform to the word of God. God will never violate his word. There are just so many scriptures that talk about the importance of God's word. Psalms 138 verse 2 says that God has magnified his word above all of his name. Now the name of Jesus, there's many scriptures that talk about the name of Jesus being like a strong tower. Philippians chapter 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. The name of Jesus is powerful and yet the Bible says that he has exalted his word even above his name. And so you by by looking at those two things, you can say that the word of God is uh, very important. It's a critical. If anything violates the word of God, then it's not coming from God. God would never violate his word. It says over in first John that the spirit and the word are, are, are one, that they agree in John chapter one. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The written Word of God that we have is infallible. Now, there are some things, like, for instance, in the King James Bible, the word music is spelled M-U-S-I-C-K. And some people will point to that as it's fallible. It's wrong. It's not wrong. It's just an old English spelling. That's the way it was spelled back then. Some people will look at things and say this wasn't translated right. 
I believe that if you take the Word of God and really study it out, the Word of God comments on itself and uh, you can find the true heart, the true meaning of everything God meant to communicate right there in the Word. It's all there. So anyway, my point is that God's Word is infallible. God's Word is an acid test. And anything that God ever speaks to us will never, never, never contradict the spirit and the meaning of what the written Word of God has to say. Now, as I've taught on the previous uh, messages, God speaks to us in impressions, perceptions, discernments, intuitions. It comes to us in our spirit, in not necessarily in words, but just in thoughts, perceptions, things like this. And then we have to discern whether our thoughts and intuitions, perceptions, are inspired by the devil, or whether they are just coming from our own selfish nature, or whether the, it is God speaking to us. Those are the three sources. Satan can put desires in your heart. Uh, Satan can give you thoughts that are uh, cor incorrect. And then you can think things on your own. I mean, a lot of stuff we blame on the devil, but the truth is it's not the devil. It's just your old carnal self. And you have to be able to discern, is it the devil, is it myself, or is it God? How do you do that? Well, again, it's the Word of God. Nothing that the Lord says to you will ever contradict the teachings of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says that the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That verse says the word of God is quick. That word quick means alive. It's living. It's God breathed. This is not just a book. This is an inspired book. There may be some, uh, you know, other books, even Christian books or secular books that have an anointing on them. But they, nothing is inspired the way that the word of God is. God's word is God breathed. And in, in God's word, there is an ability to discern between soul and spirit. The soul and the spirit are so close that the average person doesn't even recognize a difference. You'll even If you look in the Strong's Dictionary and look up the word soul or spirit, it will define spirit as uh, the intangible soul, which is not accurate. Uh, there is a difference between your spirit and your soul, but they are so closely linked that many people, even uh, sometimes religious people, don't make a clear distinction. They use the term soul and spirit interchangeably. The average person that you meet on the street, if you ask them, you know, what does man consist of? Well, they will recognize the physical body because they can see and feel it. And then they'll recognize that there's a personality, an emotional part on the inside because they can perceive that. But that's about as far as most people go. Functionally, they only recognize the physical body and the soul. But there is a third part of us, the spirit. And the Spirit is the part of us that got born again. Second Corinthians 5.17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things are become new. That's not talking about your physical body. It's not talking about your soul, your mental, emotional part. You'll still have some of the same thoughts, same memories, same feelings, etc. But in your spirit, you are completely brand new. And you're perfect. You're complete. You have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, in your spirit. You know all things, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. So your spirit is perfect, and it is perfectly reliable. If you could distinguish, is it your spirit, if you're born again, is it your spirit communicating with you, or is it your flesh, just your own desires, your own emotions? If you could discern that, then you can always discern whether your thoughts and feelings and perceptions and intuitions are of God or of the flesh. It's that simple. But it's hard to distinguish between spirit and soul. The only way you can effectively do it is through the Word of God. That's what Hebrews 4.12 is saying, that the Word of God is quick, it's alive and powerful. It is so powerful, it can even distinguish between soul and spirit. How does it do that? 
Anything that comes from your spirit will be perfect like the word of God. It will never, your spirit never operates in, you know, a carnal jealousy. It never operates in depression. It never operates in anger and bitterness. Now there is a godly type of anger against evil, but it'll never operate against people and it'll never have its feelings hurt. It'll never be selfish. Uh, you can look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about God's kind of love. That's a product of your spirit, and it's always kind. It, it never even notices a wrong suffered. Uh, it turns the other cheek. It will put other people first. It'll always want to do what's right. Anything that is coming out of your spirit will conform to what the Word of God says. John chapter 6, verse 63. This was Jesus speaking, and he said... Uh, the spirit profits nothing. It's the spirit. Let me just, I'm going to mess this up if I don't read it. John chapter 6 and verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is spirit. It equals spirit. They don't just relate to each other. There isn't a relationship. They are one in the same. God's word is spiritual truth and reality. And anything that comes from the born again spirit or from the Holy Spirit, you could say, will conform perfectly to the word of God. So if you want to discern, is this feeling, this desire, this impression that you have, is it coming from God or is it coming from me or is it coming from the devil? All you got to do is go to the Word of God and find out, is it consistent with what the Lord says? Like say, for instance, somebody has done you wrong, and you have a desire to punch their lights out and just let them have it. Man, you are going to blast them. And you're saying, you know what? I'm delighting myself in the Lord, and that's the desire of my heart. I think this is God telling me to go over there and hit this person. Well, does that conform to Scripture? Jesus said that you're supposed to turn the other cheek. Jesus said not to render evil for evil, but instead bless them. He said to love your enemies, bless those who curse you, etc. Now, if you really study the word, this doesn't rule out self-defense. It is not talking about that you have no place for ever defending yourself. But it does rule out just, you know, revenge. It does rule out selfishness and venting your anger. And so if this desire you have, is to go punch somebody's lights out because they did something to you. And you say, I wonder if that's God. Well, no, it's not, because the Word of God shows you that that is not what the Lord says to do. Now, there needs to be some maturity on your part, because you can find scriptures, like in the Old Testament, that says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that if a person does something to you, you have to do the same back to them. And you find a wrath and a punishment in the Old Testament that if that's the only scripture you looked at, you might justify something like getting angry and hitting a person or even killing them. But you know what? In the New Testament, Jesus made it very clear that you've heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, etc. But I say unto you that if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you are in danger of hell fire. And he said that, no, it's changed. Now you turn the other cheek. So... When I'm saying that you have to use God's word as the ultimate test, the final authority, to judge whether these feelings and desires that you have are God-inspired, are demon-inspired, or just your own carnal nature, then it means that you have to have some maturity in the word of God. This puts a responsibility on you that if all you're doing is grabbing one of these little things out of the daily loaf thing as you walk out the door, and if you consider that your Bible reading and you read one little sentence once a week or once a month, and you think that you are judging things by the word, you're never going to be sufficient. That is, that's not good enough. You've got to have a well enough understanding of the word of God that you can rightly divide it, that you can interpret it correctly. You don't have to go to Bible school to learn that. I have a Bible school, and it's helpful. But you can know those kind of things without having to go to Bible school. You don't have to be a full-time preacher. You don't have to spend 10 hours a day studying the Word to know those things. But it is going to take some effort on your part. And you aren't going to do it if you aren't a person who is committed to studying God's Word and let the Holy Spirit inspire you in your study. 
If you aren't serious about knowing God's Word, if you're going to let somebody else tell you what God's Word said instead of you studying it and finding out, you will not be really effective in hearing the voice of God because you can't trust your feelings and impressions alone. Now, on the previous tapes, I really made a point of talking about how God leads us through these desires. But I personally, I've been seeking the Lord with all of my heart for 33 years. I've been born again for 43 years. And I have spent hundreds of thousands of hours studying the Word of God. And yet I would never just trust a feeling or an impression by itself. I constantly am putting every thought, every feeling, every desire that I have, I'm stacking it up against the Word of God. I'm measuring it by that to see if it's compatible. And if it's not, I don't care how passionately I feel about something. I do not go with the feeling. I go with God's Word first and foremost. Now, the things that I'm saying right here, I'm going to explain this more But right now, this is beginning to probably rub some people the wrong way because there are a lot of people who are so into being led by the Holy Spirit and just following their desires and their perceptions and their feelings that what I'm saying to them is restrictive. It hinders them. In other words, they can't find a scripture to verify it. But I'm so passionate about it. I don't care what the Word says. I believe that God speaks to us. You need to be led by the Spirit. I remember specifically that one of our Bible college students, uh, I was really emphasizing how important it is to know the Word and to judge every desire and feeling and impression by the Word, exactly what I'm saying here. And he came up to me and shared that his wife had had a dream. And in this dream, she dreamed that she landed on a beach. And it was during wartime. It was like the Normandy beaches. And uh, the beach was totally mined. You know, it had landmines all through it. And the Lord spoke to her in this dream. This is what she dreamed, that the Lord showed her a map of where every mine was and said, would you rather have this map or would you rather have me speak to you and tell you where each one of these mines is? And uh, her response in this dream was, and her criticism of me was that, man, Following a map, you're subject to making mistakes, but if you could just hear God tell you in your ear, step here, step there, that's much better. And she was using that to say that this is the way it is in hearing the voice of the Lord. You need to be more spirit-led than you are word. The word is just like a map. It's just a physical thing. It's not living. It's not alive. It doesn't speak to you. You can make mistakes. You need to be more into the spirit. But you know what? That is a perfect example of what I believe the true way of listening to God is. It's not either the map or the voice. It's both. If you can follow this analogy, if you landed on a beach and you were given a map of where every mine was, and you had a choice between the map or hearing a voice, which would you rather have? Well, the correct way is I'd rather have both. Because, see, if all you did was listen to a voice, and we're talking about, you know, following impressions, desires, feelings, you can also hear the voice of the devil, and you can also hear the voice of your own flesh. How do you know that this voice is telling you the right step to take? This is a life and death issue. But if the voice, the spirit, and the word agree perfectly, well, then what you could do is look at the map, which is representative of the Word of God, and you could see what it says, and then you could hear a voice. And if the voice and the map agreed perfectly, then you could say, man, that's the right voice, and this is the right interpretation of the map because the voice is verifying it, and you could use those things as a check and balance, and that would be infinitely superior. See, some people want to only be led by the Spirit, and they ignore the Word. That's like hearing a voice and not following the map. Other people only want to follow the map, but they aren't going to let their spirit discern anything. And you know what? You can get a wrong interpretation of the word. You could read the map incorrectly. How do you know what point you're at? But if you put the two together, it's an infallible guide. And this is what I'm talking about. Yes, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. So you follow those desires. You take that as being God speaking to you. 
But it's also possible for you to have ungodly desires. So you have to discern. You can't just go with every desire. You have to discern, is this desire God speaking to me? Is it coming from the spirit or is it coming from the flesh or is it coming from the devil? And the way you do that is to take God's word. And if you feel like going out and committing adultery, and I mean you feel passionately about it, and so therefore you say, this is a desire of my heart. I know this is God. Well, does that square with the word of God? Of course not. The Bible doesn't tell you to go commit adultery. And so you know what? It doesn't matter how passionately you feel about it. It doesn't matter how you rationalize it, how you come up with the justification. It doesn't agree with the word of God. Therefore, it's not God giving you this desire. And so it's just that simple. It's really that simple. Now, that's not necessarily easy because, as I said, this is dependent upon you having a correct interpretation of the word. Knowing just a one or two scriptures, knowing a tiny bit of scripture can actually get you in trouble. Satan quoted scripture to Jesus, but he misquoted it. He added a little bit and subtracted a little bit from Psalms chapter 91. But Jesus picked up on it because he knew the word like the back of his hand. Knowing just a little bit of Scripture can get you in trouble. You need to know enough of it that you can rightly discern. But a correct knowledge of the Word is the ultimate test as to whether what you are perceiving as the voice of God is God or if it's you or if it's the devil. And you've got to know God's Word. God's Word is quick and powerful. It divides between the soul and the spirit and discerns between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the way God speaks to you is through these intents, these thoughts, perceptions, feelings. And you've got to be able to rightly judge it by the word. Man, that is a powerful truth. I have felt a lot of things. And yet uh, they haven't been of God because they didn't conform to the word of God. I've had desires for things before that didn't go along with the Word of God. I am not perfect. I am not pure Holy Spirit. I am not 100% in the Spirit. And I have to constantly be evaluating things by the Word. And so you have to be able to evaluate everything that God speaks to you by the Word. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, but wait a minute. There are some decisions that you make that there isn't a Scripture on it. There is no Scripture. Like, say, for instance... You want to know, should you marry, uh, you know, Susie or, or uh, Jan over here? And you don't know which one is the right one for you. And you desire both of them. And you're really having a hard time. And you're wondering. And you say, there is no scripture that goes along with this. Well, there are guidelines. There may not be a scripture that says Susie is the one or Jan is the one. But there are scriptures that give you guidelines. For instance... The scripture says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that you should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Or maybe that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That you shouldn't, no, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 6. That be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. And so you know what? That gives you a guideline. If, if Susie was a Christian and Jan wasn't, well, then you know what? You can bet your life on it that God is not leading you to marry Jan. At least not at this time, not until she's a believer. Now, I know that there's some people that don't like that because they say, but I love her so much. I'm so passionate. I'm believing that she will change and on and on. You can justify it however you want. But I have talked to hundreds, thousands of people who've gone ahead with their passion instead of what God's word says. And you know what? Passion will wear off eventually and reality will set in. And I've had those people come back to me by the hundreds and say, I wished I'd have waited. This isn't God. You know, if you are a true believer, you are either going to lose your spirituality and become carnal like them, or if you stay spiritual, there is going to be a rift and a division between you because the most important thing in your life you can't share. So see, God's Word does give you direction, even in something like that. When it comes to, like, buying a house, Somebody says, well, there's no direction in the Word of God about buying a house. Yes, there is. There's a lot of teaching on finances and about being in debt and about extending yourself and not being able to make your payments. There's talking, there's talking scripture about greed. And you know what? You need to take those scriptures and say, is this something I really need? Is this just a lust? Is, is this something that I can afford or am I dreaming? The Word of God will guide you in all of those kind of decisions. 
Uh, a scripture that I use often is out of Mark chapter 4. And that scripture says at first, the kingdom of God is like a seed sown in the ground. And then there's first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Now, some of you may not get much out of that, but if you'll meditate on it, what the Lord has shown me is that this is talking about in the kingdom, there is growth. If you are letting God be the one to prosper you, you are going to grow in, say, financial prosperity in stages. You aren't going to go from never having had a house to having a million-dollar home. That is not the way that God does it. Some people may hope that he is and pray that he is, but that's not the way that the kingdom of God operates. He will, first of all, give you a step, something that's better than what you've got. And as you step into that and occupy that and use maturity, then God will increase you and give you the next step. And so there's growth stages. If a person who had been living on the street came to me and somebody offered them a million-dollar house and it looks like it could work out and they're praying about, is this God's will? And they're coming from being a street person to living in a mansion. I'd say, no, that's not God. Because you know what? There's no growth. There's no steps. If you haven't even got your life together to where you are able to have a decent, you know, first step home, you aren't going to go into a million dollar home. That's not the way God does it. Now, somebody might offer you something like that. You could win the lottery, but that's not God's system. Now, see, here's another thing. Some people say, well, there's nothing in the Bible about the lottery. Oh, there's an abundance of scriptures about wealth gotten by vanity takes away the life of the owners thereof. It says there is benefit to all labor, but when you get an inheritance quickly, it'll be destroyed and it'll be sour in the end. And on and on. There's a lot of scriptures against gambling. Gambling, winning something for nothing, is an absolutely ungodly principle. God is not going to fix the lottery for anybody. That's dishonest. God's not going to help you win the lottery. And see, if you're praying and saying, I'm wondering if this is God leading me to buy this ticket, because God is, I think God's impressed me, I'm going to win the lotto. No, God didn't say that to you. And I don't care how passionately you feel about it. That is not God's system. That's not God's way of blessing you. You're just wasting your money. Now, it's possible that you could win the lottery, but if you did, it wouldn't be God that gave it to you. You say, well, it's a good thing. It has to be God. No, God's not going to fix the lottery. God's not going to make you win. If that was true, how many hundreds of thousands of Christians are praying for God to let them win the lottery? Which one does God choose? Does he have favorites? Is it the one who fasts the most? God's not into that kind of stuff. You aren't going to have God supply your needs through the lottery, through some kind of a gambling thing. That doesn't mean you couldn't win, but if you win, it's chance, and it wasn't God, and uh, it has a real potential of destroying you. If uh, the Bible talks about those who have wealth, that it you can pierce yourself through with many and foolish and hurtful lust, which drown man in perdition, First Timothy chapter 6. If God's going to prosper you, there will be stages to it, steps. You will grow progressively. You don't go from zero to a thousand miles an hour. You'd be smashed up against the back window. You can't do that. That's not God's system. See, what I'm trying to communicate here is there's areas that people think, well, there's nothing in Scripture that talks about this. No, Scripture deals with everything. And you need to have enough wisdom. To, you have to have enough knowledge of the Word of God and then the wisdom to use that knowledge and apply it to your situation. And you can discern, is it God leading me to do this? Even though there isn't a specific scripture that calls out the name of the person or tells you exactly which house to buy, there are guidelines in the Word of God. And once you get those guidelines, I look at it like, for instance, a football field. On a football field, there's sidelines. And anything inside of those boundaries is in bounds. But anything outside of them are out of bounds. You can't go out of bounds. It's an automatic, you know, you're out of bounds. Your forward progress stops the moment you step out of bounds. Well, the Bible provides me with boundaries. The Bible tells me to do certain things. Like, say, for instance, if I was offered a job, but if the job was some type of sales uh, position and I had to falsify or cheat things, like, for instance, my brother is a mechanic, and he's a vocational mechanics teacher at a high school, but he has applied at some car dealerships for a mechanic job during the summer, and in a couple of times they have told him that this is your base salary, 
and then you overcharge the people and you do work that they don't need and we give you a percentage of the work that you cheat these people out of and that's how you make your salary. Well, now my brother is a believer and because of that, see, he wouldn't do something like that. Now there is no scripture that says you can't overcharge a, a person for their mechanical work. But there are scriptures that says don't bear false witness. It talks about using just weights and measures, and it provides you with guidelines. And if I was offered a job like that, and yet I had to do something dishonest, well, then I'd, nope, nope, that's not the job for me. And it would settle it. God's word speaks. God's word has an application for everything. I even heard a man one time who was a, uh, holding a tent revival, and his tent had blown down the previous year. And he was asking God about, why did my tent blow down? And he was seeking God for an answer. And he turned over to Isaiah 54, where it says, Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you shall break forth on the right hand and the left. And he says, man, God told me that that was the problem. My cords and my stakes were too short. (laughs) Now, that may be a little bit of, uh, you know, liberty with the word. That may not be an exact interpretation, but the point I'm getting at, he says, man, God's word has an answer for everything. And I believe it does. There is no situation in my life that I don't have some scripture that comes to bear on it. There is nothing. My relationships with people, the word of God teaches you. I mean, the word of God is a, uh, man, it is a masterpiece about personal relationships between you and other people. It tells you how to get along. It tells you how to deal with people. It tells you how to bring conviction, like heaping coals of fire on their head. God's Word tells you what to do in every single situation. It may not tell you specifically, go to this house, but it'll give you guidelines that tells you to go over and bless your neighbor and do these things for him and stuff. And it's guidelines. I had a man one time who was trying to be so led by the Spirit, he was a minister, that he had he had his next-door neighbor dying of a terminal disease. And he wanted to go over and pray for him. See, that was the desire of his heart. To me, that was God leading him because it lines up with Scripture. The Bible says when you go into a town, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. It says these signs will follow those that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. And on and on the scripture goes about all of this. So, see, his desire to pray for this person was consistent with scripture. So, man, I believe that that was God. I would have prayed for him. But what he did, he says, I had the desire to do it, but I just wasn't sure it was God. And I, so I never did it. And that guy died. And he was asking me about this. And I told him, yes, that was God. And you don't have to have God tell you in a booming voice, go pray for your neighbor. Because the scriptures already said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the leper. When you go into a town, heal the sick that are therein. See, the written word of God has already given you instructions. And boy, please listen to this. This will help you. As long as you haven't obeyed the written word of God, why would God speak any further instructions to you if you've despised the written instruction? If you aren't following the written instruction, why should he just give you another opportunity for failure, another opportunity for disobedience? By speaking to you something specific beyond Scripture. I don't believe that that's the nature of God. If it's already revealed in Scripture, God's not going to speak to you outside of Scripture. If the Scripture has already given you a very specific thing, like go into all the world and preach the gospel, you don't have to have God speak to you and tell you something specific. Let me give you an example of this in Acts chapter 16. This is the Apostle Paul, and I wish I had time to go through the book of Acts and just show you this, but I'll say it. You'll have to go back and verify it. If you follow the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys, they're just like systematic journeys. He would go to an area like he would go to Ephesus, which was the biggest uh, town, the dominant commercial center in Asia Minor, Uh, what the Bible calls Asia, and he ministered for three years there, and then the people that he touched went out all around there, and he would just travel in a systematic fashion. It wasn't like he would go to one place and then go somewhere totally different, and then he wasn't being led by the Spirit, quote-unquote, as such. 
He just would systematically go into an area and hit everything along the way. And in Acts chapter 16, we find where he had already been to Derba, Derby, Lystra, Iconium. All of these are places in Galatia. And it says in verse 6, Now when they had gone through throughout Pergia and the region of Galatia, these are two different regions. It would be like what we call a state or something in the United States. And he had covered those areas. It says he was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered him not. Now, what I'm wanting you to see is the Holy Ghost forbid them to go into Bithynia and um, to go into um, Asia. The Holy Ghost forbid them to go those directions. But did this mean that Paul just sat down and did nothing until he heard another voice from the Lord? I'm going to say something here that I pray you'll understand what I'm saying. If you if you aren't careful, you could get offended and miss my point. I don't believe that Paul was told directly by the Holy Ghost to go to Dist- Lystra, Derby, Iconium, and go here. And I know for sure that he wasn't told by the Holy Ghost to go into Asia and then to go into Bithynia, because if he had have been, the Holy Ghost wouldn't have turned around and have forbidden him. The Holy Ghost is not double-minded. In other words, Paul was just going without the Holy Ghost speaking to him specifically. Now, some people are thinking, so he was just in the flesh. He was wrong. No, because he already had the written word of God go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he was just going. He was going systematically and preaching, and that was consistent. Now, you don't need any special word beyond that. And Paul was just going everywhere that he could. He didn't have to have God tell him to go to a place. It wasn't that way because if it had been, if God had told him to go into Bithynia, then he wouldn't have turned around and told him, Nope, I made a mistake. Don't go there. Stop. See, he was just going. He was going on the written word, not a specific word. And that's the way that it's supposed to be. However, he was aware that God can give instructions beyond the written word. It'll never contradict it, but it can be in addition to. And so he was sensitive that when he was headed into Bithynia and the Holy Ghost uh, told him not to go, probably because he lost his desire to go, then he didn't go. But you know what? He didn't sit still. He just took off in another direction. And finally we see that in a night vision, in verse 9, Acts 16, 9, in a night vision um, appeared to Paul, or excuse me, in a vision appeared to Paul in the night, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed to him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So Paul finally got a specific direction beyond just going to all the world, But he wasn't waiting on it. Matter of fact, I believe the reason that this came to him in the night is because in the morning he would have been taken off in another direction. He wasn't waiting on something specific. The Word of God is sufficient. Now, if God wants to give you something in addition to the Word of God, it would never contradict. It will only supplement and bear witness. But if he wants to give you more specific direction than going to all of the world, fine. But don't wait on it. In other words, don't assume that you're at a red light waiting on God to tell you to do something. Assume that you've got a green light and you just go with what God has put in your heart, what the Word of God says, and while you're going, be attentive to see if there's any specific or additional direction. Man, that is awesome what I've just said. I don't know if I communicated that in a way that you totally got it. If you if it didn't touch you, you need to back it up and listen to it again. But that is awesome. In my own personal life, uh, when I first got started in ministry, I didn't have very many opportunities and stuff. And I started off praying. You know, if a person called and asked me to come minister, I'd, I'd say, because it was the religious formula that I had been taught, I'd say, well, let me pray about it and see if I'm supposed to go. Well, about the first time or two I did that, the Lord got on my case and he said, pray about it. I told you to go into all the world. You don't have any conflicts. Nobody's asked you to come for anything. If somebody asks you to come, go. And you know what? For probably 15 or 20 years, I never prayed about where I went to minister the gospel. If somebody gave me an opportunity, I'd go. And I saw wonderful things happen. 
eventually I reached a place where there's more opportunities to go minister the gospel than there are uh, than there is time. I just can't take advantage of all of them. So now I have to tune in and get more specific direction, and I have to pray over which one do I take. But until there was more opportunities than I could take, I never prayed over it. I just went everywhere. I believe that's scriptural. That's taking God's word as being his voice. Now, I've grown where I've gotten to where I can take God's word and act on it in a general form, but I'm constantly listening. Does God have any specifics? And if those specifics come, then I'll still measure them, weigh them against God's word, because it will never contradict what God says. God speaks to us through his word. And until we've acted on what he said in his word, there's no reason for us to look for any more specific direction. If you would adopt that mindset, most of you wouldn't need to hear very much because God's word tells us just about everything that we need. However, there are more specific directions that aren't clearly lined up in Scripture, such as when you start flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I've mentioned this before, but I've called out people's names before. I've said, man, God shows me that your name is and that you have this wrong with you, etc., 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 there's no scripture that says that. And yet the Bible talks about flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible shows that it's possible. Jesus called Zacchaeus by name when he was up in the tree. He had never seen him, and yet he called out his name. So there's a scriptural precedent for it. But how do you hear those specific instructions? How do you flow in the gifts and tell a person what their sickness is and which vertebra it is that's hurt when they didn't even tell you that they had a problem in their back? How do you know things like that? How do you hear that kind of voice? Well, first of all, you take everything you know in Scripture and you do it. And as you're doing it, then God can speak to you through, again, your spirit. And you just know things. When I pray for people in prayer lines, uh, I've prayed for people before up to three and four hours at a time. And I mean, it's just like clockwork. I come to every person and God gives me a word, shows me something about every person. Now, not everybody operates in that all of the time because that's a gift of the Spirit. I have a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge and a discerning of spirits are the spiritual gifts that God's given me to minister to people. But everybody can operate in this to a degree. It may not be your ministry as such, but you can operate in it to a degree where you have God speak things to you about people, about circumstances, about situations. And the way that that comes is, as I'm praying for people, I just know things about them. I'll look at a person, and all of a sudden I can tell that, man, they're discouraged, or I can tell that they're fearful, or I just discern things. And it is not based on how they look. It's not body language and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, when a person has something real overt like that in the flesh, they're just depressed, their shoulders are hanging down, that hinders me. Because then I begin to start wondering, is this a carnal discernment or is it a spiritual discernment? When I know a person and I know things about them, it's harder for me to minister to them because I have trouble discerning. Is this based on what I know physically, naturally, or is it God? It's harder for me to discern. But when I have never seen a person before, when there is no physical indication of anything, and all of a sudden these thoughts and impressions and knowledge just start coming to me, I have learned to trust them. Now, again, I put this qualification on it, that if I wasn't seeking God, If I had been out, just say, for instance, living in total sin, if I was mean and angry and bitter, and if something seriously was wrong in my life, I would not minister to a person because I couldn't trust my feelings and impressions. I would pray for them, but as far as ministering in the gifts of the Spirit and saying, Thus saith the Lord, I wouldn't do it. But when I know that my heart is focused on God and I know that my heart is right with God, then I trust those feelings, impressions that come to me. And you know what? I have seen it happen hundreds of thousands of times that that is God speaking to me, speaking through me to people. And that's the way that it happens. Well, that's powerful. But you know what? I still compare it with the Word of God. For instance, the Lord may show me that, and this has happened to me before, the Lord shows me that a person is a homosexual. I've discerned that a number of times, and it's not based on something physical. It's just a knowing. But you know what? The Word of God even inspires me in situations like that because it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that all of the gifts of the Spirit are meant for edification, exhortation, and comfort. 
Now, somebody here may be thinking, well, now, wait a minute. Some of the gifts of the Spirit in the Old Testament, a prophet pronounced judgment, said people were going to die, this and that. That's not edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's the ministry of a prophet. That is not the gift of prophecy. There's a difference between the gift of prophecy and the ministry of a prophet. A prophet can pronounce judgment and things as has happened in Scripture, but the simple gift of prophecy and word of wisdom, word of knowledge, always have to be for edification, exhortation, and comfort. So I remember one time specifically that the Lord showed me that a person was a homosexual, but rather than me just saying, you're a homosexual, man, I rebuked you, God's angry. See, that's inconsistent with the new covenant and what the scripture says about the gifts being for edification, exhortation, and comfort. So even though I discern something, I don't just speak out anything that I feel. What I do is take the word of God and say, God, that must be you. Now, how should I minister it? Well, it has to edify. It has to exhort. It has to comfort. So what I would do is take that discernment, and then I'd turn around and I'd say, you know, the Lord is showing me that there's something in your life. And it depends. If there's, you know, people around that could hear, I don't believe God wants to just nail this person. So I'd either turn off my microphone or I'd whisper in their ear or maybe I would say it in a way that is not specific, but they know specifically what I'm talking about. The Lord shows me that there is some sin in your life that, I mean, it's terrible. And you are guilt-ridden. Man, you feel so vile. You feel like, how could God love me? And the whole time I know I'm talking about homosexuality, but I'm saying it in such a way that it's not, you know, just hanging this guy's laundry out in front of everybody to see. And the personal man, they'll begin to cry, yes, it's true. And I'll say, you know what? God loves you. God is setting you free from that right now. And I can minister to a person. But all of that, I may get a discernment, an impression from the Spirit, but the Word of God tells me how to minister it. I look at how Jesus ministered to the woman taken in the very act of adultery. And he didn't condemn her. And he says, no man condemns you. Go and sin no more. And I follow that example of love. And I minister to people in adultery with that compassion instead of judgment. See, the word of God has to be constantly in harness with whatever you say you are discerning from God. And God's word gives you some great, great instructions about how to hear his voice. Let's turn over to Colossians chapter 3. And let me show you a passage of scripture that I use, I mean constantly. Now this will go along closely with what I said on the second tape about delighting yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But to me it's a little different, it's uh, it's like more specific. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. It says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. This word rule is the word that we get umpire from. You know, an umpire, like in American baseball, you just, the ball is thrown and the umpire has to say strike or ball. He can't sit there and debate about it. And then if he calls it something, he can't come back and say, you know, I think I was wrong. I'm going to change that to a strike instead of a ball. No, when you umpire, it means that you just make a decision. And once the umpire speaks, that's it. You're stuck with it. You are going to, it's that kind of a decision. So this is saying, let the peace of God umpire in your heart. Let it make some decisions. In other words, make decisions based on whether or not you feel peace about it. The spirit within you, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, etc. Peace is a fruit of the spirit. It's constant. Your spirit always, always, always has peace about what God wants you to do. And all you've got to do is get in the spirit and then discern, do I feel peace about this or do I feel a reservation about this? And if you will follow the peace of God, it'll rule in your heart. On the last tape, I gave an illustration about that elder uh, that I agreed to put into the church in Pritchett, Colorado, and I didn't feel peace about it, and I suffered greatly for it. Well, uh, I've learned a lesson to let the peace of God rule in my heart. Actually, the very first time I ever operated in this was when the Lord touched my life, March the 23rd, 1968. That's when I just fell in love with God. And because of that, I was in my first year of college at that time, 
And I lost all desire to be in college. Matter of fact, not only did I not desire it, I hated it. I hated it. I knew that God was leading me to do something else. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know that I was going to be in ministry, but I knew that I wasn't going to be a math major, which is what my major was in college. I knew something was wrong, and I hated it. And so based on that desire, I made the announcement to my family and friends that I was quitting school. And man, it would have been better if I would have committed adultery. They could have forgiven me for that. But boy, to say that I was quitting school was unforgivable. My mother, everybody in my family has been a teacher. And when I said I was quitting school, that was like the worst sin possible. My mother didn't talk to me for two weeks, etc. I had the leaders of my church come against me and criticize me. And because of that, I backed off of it. I stayed in school because of the pressure of other people, but I hated it. My desire was going the other direction. And it's a long, long story, but finally, I came to a scripture in John, in uh, Romans fourteen twenty three that says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And all of a sudden, I just realized that, you know what? I wasn't doing what I really felt like I should be, and I either needed to get out and operate in faith, or I needed to get rid of this thought of quitting school and stay in school, but I needed to get into one or the other and do it in faith because I was in sin in my undecision. And so when I saw that scripture, I came home that night and I said, God, I am making a decision tonight. Tomorrow when I get up, I am going to commit to one course of action or the other. And I just determined. And the way I started off, I just got into his presence. I was praying. I was worshiping the Lord. And the closer I got to God, I believed that that desire would either diminish or strengthen. And anyway, even though I had a strong desire to quit school, I also had fear. I didn't feel total peace about quitting school because it could cost me my relationship with my mother and friends. It could cost me my relationship with people at church. I would lose government support if I quit school from my father's Social Security, and I could be drafted and sent to Vietnam. That was during the height of the Vietnam War. I'd lose my student deferment if I quit school. There was enough things that was at stake that I didn't feel total peace about quitting school, and yet I had to make a decision. Well, that's the night that God showed me this verse in Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. In other words, like an umpire. An umpire may not know exactly, they may not be perfectly certain that this is the way that this decision should go, but they've got to make a decision and they just make one and go with it. And the Lord said, you've got to let the peace of God rule in your heart. And I said, okay, I'm going to make a decision. But then I was still being torn and I said, but God, which direction do I have the most peace about? When I thought about quitting school, I didn't really feel peace because of all of the potential problems. When I thought about staying in school, I certainly didn't feel peace. And so finally, here's the way I arrived at it. I just made a decision. I said, God, if I have to make a decision tonight, which I do because I'd already committed to that, and if this decision was life and death, which it really was, because I could be sent to Vietnam and killed, and if it was irrevocable, I'm not going to be able to, I mean, I'm going to have to make a decision and stick with it. I said, what would I do? Well, immediately, the one I felt the most peace about was quitting school and just trusting God. So I made that decision. And the Lord also gave me another piece of wisdom, which I think will really help you in this situation. He showed me out of James chapter 3, it says, you know, that you can turn about a ship with a very small helm. In other words, the rudder on a ship. But he showed me that that rudder, you could flip it 360 degrees, and it's not going to steer that ship unless the ship is moving. The ship has to be moving. You have to make a decision and head in some direction. As long as I was in in indecision, God couldn't bear witness with staying in school or out of school because I hadn't made a decision yet. So he told me to start moving, but he also gave me this piece of wisdom. He says, you don't have to go full steam ahead. Move slowly and check it out and let my spirit either bear witness and you will feel even greater peace about it or within a very short period of time, you'll know that you were wrong. So I, I made my decision that night, went to bed, got up in the morning, and the way I began to check it out, before I stopped school, before I announced to all of these people who could have gotten mad at me, what I chose to do was just go to the three people who had been the most vocal critical critics of me quitting school. 
One of them was my youth director, and another one was a teacher that I'd had in school. And this teacher was a very good friend of my mother and was siding with my mother. And I mean, just ream me out about this, thinking that she was doing a service to my mother, helping me stay in school. And anyway, the next day, I went to these three people, and I instead of going in and arguing with them, trying to convince them, I just walked in and I said, I've made a decision. And the first one I went to was this teacher. And I said, I've made my decision. And I said, God has told me to quit school. And I said, I know it could cost my life. I could go to Vietnam. I know it's going to cost me money. I know that there's people that won't understand, but God has spoken to me, and that's where I'm going. And in this part, I was braced for him to just blast me. And instead, this teacher looked at me, tears welled up in her eyes, and she said, I envy you. And I was shocked. I said, what for? And she says, I'm nearly 60 years old. And I don't know that I've ever found what God's will for my life is. And she says, you're 18 years old and you've heard from God. She says, your life's never going to be the same. She says, I'd give anything to have been in your situation when I was 18. Man, I walked out of that place shouting and screaming. My peace was going through the roof. I went and talked to the other two people. Both of them just said, man, this is God. And you know what? Within 24 hours, my decision was so confirmed that I announced it to the world. And even though it cost me a lot, I can guarantee that is one of the best decisions I have ever made in my life. And so I... I let God speak to me through my desires because I was seeking him with my whole heart. I checked it out by the word of God. I I took this scripture in Colossians 3.15 and I followed what gave me peace. And you know what? It has become just a lifestyle. I just don't do things that don't cause peace in my life. If I'm agitated about it, if I have a decision, something that I'm being forced into doing, if I don't feel good about it, You know what I do? I, first of all, spend some extra time in the presence of the Lord, just praying, praising, focusing my attention on the Lord to make sure that I it's not the flesh that's causing me these negative feelings. And as I get closer into the presence of God, if the desire uh, diminishes, well, then I say that that's not God. Because the more I delight myself in the Lord, the less I desire to do it. But if the desire is increasing then I go with it, and I let the peace of God rule in my heart. And, you know, there's been some times that I've actually uh, not felt peace about doing something that God wanted me to do because I had been carnal and I hadn't been seeking God. But I still think that it's better for me not to go ahead and just do it because it looks logical, and this is, you know, until I get into the presence of God and get this conflict resolved, I shouldn't be doing it. I need to follow faith. I believe the Lord has spoken to me that he would bless me more if I make a mistake in faith than he would if I do the right thing in unbelief. I need to follow that peace that's in my heart. And this is how you hear the voice of God. I tell you, these are some awesome things I've shared. You know, this leads right up to, this is a foundation for a lot of other things I'd like to say. Matter of fact, I've got a new three-tape series entitled How to Flow in the Gifts of the Spirit. And it'll take what I've said during these three tapes and it will just now amplify it into how do you have God speak to you through a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. And it's actually like the second step to all of the things that I've been teaching. If you'd like to get that tape set, I believe it would be a real blessing to you. But, you know, apart from even flowing in the gifts of the spirit, just hearing the voice of God in your everyday life, hearing him tell you that he loves you, Having God reinforce you and just confirm his love to you is, it's invaluable. To be led by God in your decisions and not to stumble and fall over things, but to hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk thou in it. Man, that's awesome. To have this peace of God to where you are constantly at peace and you aren't in turmoil, you aren't stressed out, but you're letting the peace of God rule in your life. I tell you, this is a tremendous way. I'm a, I'm aware that there are a lot of people that teach on how to hear God's voice and they use circumstances and they let circumstances, you know, you, you put out fleeces and you test and you do this and God has used those things. He used it for Gideon in the book of Judges. 
There are ways that God can lead you through circumstances, through your failure. You can learn by your hard knocks and mistakes. But I don't believe that that's God's best. It may be the most prevalent method because most people aren't really listening for God's voice and doing what we're talking about. They aren't delighting themselves in the Lord. So I'm not saying that you can't hear from God any other way than what I've shared. But I believe that what I've shared in this three-tape series is God's best for you hearing his voice. And it's the most dominant way that he's going to speak to you. And it will actually prevent problems instead of just having to learn by your problems and by your mistakes. And I offer these things to you as things that have worked in my life. And God's no respecter of persons. They'll work in your life too. So I just believe that God is going to use this to cause you to hear his voice. And as that happens, I promise you, his will is nothing but good for you. Thoughts of peace to give you an expected end. You can count on having a glorious life if you start listening to the voice of the Lord.